Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Will Show. I am your host, Dr. Will. I'm feeling pretty good. Wife and I went to Olive Garden, got to buy one, take one. And to top that off, it's just like, mm. so I'm going to have me a little ice cream tonight. I don't need it, but I'm going to have it. And uh, I'm sitting here with Christina Torres, and we will be talking about race in education. So for those of you who are watching this show, hopefully this topic is not too controversial to you. We want you to join this conversation. We want you to be a part of this conversation. Tweet it out. Get a back channel going on. Uh, and hit us up. So for those who are watching this show and have no idea who Christina Torres is, and that would be a shame. <laughs> Christina, will you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hello again. Um, hi, my name is Christina Torres. Uh, I'm a seventh and ninth grade English teacher and drama teacher in Honolulu, Hawaii. I currently teach at University Laboratory School on the island of Oahu. Um, and yeah, I do teaching stuff. I, I roll with these cool folks at Educolor, which is one of the many reasons why I like talking about these things. Um, yes, that's me. Awesome, awesome. All <laughs> right, so let's just get into this. Yep. Now, race is one of those topics that is very difficult to talk about, especially in mixed company. Now, I'm pretty sure that we both know people that are great folks but when it comes to race they either gloss over it or mm -hmm. they don't see the issues that we see mm -hmm. why do you think race is such a difficult topic to talk about and why does race matter in education yeah i think that's a, such a great big question and i'll definitely at some point send out there are a bunch of Great links to Jay Smooth, for example, is a great uh, sort of speaker to this about why it's so hard. I think one of the reasons it's so hard is that one, society has made it very hard. Um, if you just look at things like you know some of the textbooks today and things like that, they're starting to really gloss over some of the systemic things that have made race an issue. Um, one of the pushback I get a lot from folks when I start talking about race and they don't want to talk about it is they say that, well, race is just a social construct and it's not really real and we created it, so we should just ignore it. Um, and the problem is like, yes, w race might be a, a construct, but the problem is it's one that not only are we all living by, but is affecting where we can live, <laughs> how much money we can make, who pays attention to us. So even if it's a construct, it's one that's having very real ramifications on us. Um, so I think it's just, in some ways, there's that people just don't want to, people want to think it's it's over, that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, didn't we move past this is, I think, the idea for lots of folks. Um, and I think because when you bring it up to, especially folks that have some kind of privilege, whether it's race or gender or anything like that, they want to believe, well, it's it's not my fault. I didn't do it. So why are you attacking me? And the thing is, it's not about attacking, right? It's let's have an honest conversation. And I think sort of your second question, why does why do we need to talk about education? If I don't talk about it with my students, I am denying them the opportunity to be able to break down the things that they're going to face later in life. I didn't understand until I was in college all the ways that I had internalized the oppression that faced me. Um, and it was really hard and I'm still getting over it day to day. And I'm still dealing with it day to day. And I don't want my kids to deal, to not, I mean, they're gonna have to deal with it. I want them to have the tools now to start thinking about those things, to start pushing back on those questions um, or on those things that might, you know, in the long run come up for them. So yeah, I think those are two that like, I think it's hard because people are defensive sometimes, but I think it's necessary because in some ways people are defensive. We need to learn how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So how has being a person of color impacted how you see yourself and your role as an educator? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, uh, so, yeah, that's a great question. So my parents, uh, I'm mixed, right? So I'm half Mexican, half Filipino. And both my parents actually grew up much more in, like South Central LA and my dad was for a part of time there and then a part of his time in a little area suburb mostly called Pico Rivera um, and so for them there was a big push to 
get out of the city or get out of the body or anything like that. Uh, and my dad, because he didn't speak English, I think my understanding is like English was a second language because both my parents speak English and Spanish, but Spanish primarily. There was a, you know, he was almost put in classes that weren't rigorous enough or people, you know, he might have been ESL. And it's only because a teacher found him and was like, oh no, actually you can write then moved him into honors classes. And it's only because of those honors classes that he was able to go to college and get a scholarship. And, you know, essentially after the LA riots happened, he and my mom worked really hard to move us out of LA. Um, so I grew up in a small suburb next to Laguna Beach, California. <laughs> and yeah, yes. <laughs> and I understand my own privilege. I have a lot of socioeconomic privilege. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I get, I'm just definitely a bougie brown person. I understand that. Um, so for me, it, it was much more this, this idea of being the token. Um, there were not a lot of brown kids, especially I was on an honors and AP track, which is a whole nother story about tracking kids. I was on an honors and AP track and there were certainly not a lot of Mexican students and not a lot of kids of color in general. It was mostly white and then mixed in with that Persian and East Asian. Um, and there were a lot, there was a lot of jokes and, but like not funny jokes. There was a lot of, you know, oh, go back to Mexico. I heard that a lot growing up. Um, my dad definitely, I heard people say stuff like, isn't your dad a gardener? I had a lot of those things growing up and it made it really hard for me sometimes to see the value in education. I was not always the smartest kid in the class and I struggled a lot. So I think for me, I saw on a very small scale of why am I going to keep trying when before they even talk to me, they're going to assume that my dad's a gardener and I'm going to be a maid. Like what, why am I going to do this? Why, why bother? Should, should I do, especially, you know, when you're 12 and that's what you're, you know, you're like, I, this is too hard. I don't want to do this. And it's only because my dad, you know, pushed me with this idea of like, you have to prove them wrong and you have to work harder. You have to work twice as hard to get half as far. Very Olivia Pope, that whole thing. Um, and I think that's true. I think now there was an educator to wrap up this very long answer. I think now there was an educator. I am very lucky that my parents had a lot of opportunity and sometimes luck to show them that they could eventually break that cycle of sort of where they grew up and things like that. I, I don't think it's fair though that my dad had to kind of get lucky and find a teacher that thought that he was smart and pushed him to do better. I don't think it's fair that parents that maybe are frustrated with our education system and don't have a ton of investment, or even if they do, they don't have the tools to participate in it the way that my parents did coming from a, you know, a college background. I don't think it's fair that, that their families are given the shaft just because they don't trust or they don't know how to navigate our current education system. So when I think about me as an educator now, it is in some ways to honor that legacy of education is what has moved my family forward, but at the same time, we should not be the only ones. It should not just be these random people who are able to make it um, because that's what's systemically going to keep us down. So that was a long answer. <laughs> hey, it's all good. It's all... Okay. Oh, are you freezing? No, we it's were doing it. When you hit... Uh, you still... yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. It went in and out, but we're back. <laughs> all right. Uh, when you hear the phrase colorblind, what comes to mind and where does it fall short in the discussion on race and cultural diversity? Yes, let's dig into this one. So, so I understand the notion behind wanting to be colorblind or I don't see race. I've had many well-intentioned, admittedly white friends slash boyfriends slash family of white boyfriends tell me like, well, we don't see your race. And I understand that because, you know, they, they might be, it's that idea of like, why is this controversial? They're like, well, we don't want the controversy. We don't think of you that way. There's two problems with that. The first is that it's nice that you don't judge me on my race. The problem is the rest of the world is. So <laughs> you can say you don't know you want, everyone else is. So we should, we might as well just deal with that and talk about it. But the other is that assumes that we, we don't see your race assumes that the, or, you know, we're not going to, we don't see you as different. You're not other to us. Assumes that what you are, which in that, in that case is 
white is dominant or normal and that I'm just one of you. But I'm not one of you. I have my own beautiful culture and language and context and background that is as equally valid as yours. The problem is no one's ever bothered to tell you about it or no one rather you didn't want to listen not you it's hard right <laughs> dominant culture didn't want to listen dominant culture didn't want to acknowledge the beauty of my race and my background so no one's ever shared it with the dominant culture um, so when people are colorblind yes they might on the one hand it's not going to get rid of the controversy so we should just give up that ghost immediately but on the other it's in doing so you take away a part of me that I, I love and I deserve to love. I should love that I am brown. I should get to celebrate that every single day. Um, you shouldn't have, yes, uh, yes. You, I should get to celebrate that all the time. And when you tell me you don't see that, you deny me a huge part of my humanity. I see the world through the lens of a woman of color and that should be valid and that should be special and that should be acknowledged. Um, so that's that's one of my many problems with colorblindness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the many okay. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about it. Well, I don't necessarily think about it, the term. What made me think about it differently was when I watched uh, Melody Hobson uh, and her. TED Talk on Color Brave. Mm -hmm. And when she talked about how we need to have these discussions, are we brave enough to have these discussions, these real discussions, and not, you know, as you say, not really confront it because we're, you know, we're like just this oneness of, uh, of something mm -hmm. uh, when there is a real uh deliciousness in the diversity of who we are as as humanity yes agree <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right what you said <laughs> well, thank you thank you thank you so let's get to modeling now the, this modeling piece for me is when i think about race and education is one of the most important uh, parts to it. Uh, and so whether we're talking about books that students read in the class, other materials, discussions uh, brought up in the classroom, teachers, administrators, uh, other stakeholders, I feel that students should not only expect, but should actually see themselves reflected in their classrooms, in their schools. What are your thoughts on modeling and how do you work to provide such an experience for your students? Yeah, I, so I think it's a couple of different things for me. So I think some of the thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I saw this question, but I didn't get to ask you about it. So modeling in some ways is representation, right? Like when a kid looks at the admin or the school board, there should be people that look like grown up versions of themselves there. Representation matters, right? So that's definitely one aspect. Yeah, so let's start there. I think for me, especially as an English teacher, I'm very fortunate in that my content area lends itself to modeling in some ways. Um, and some of it is that being in Hawaii, Hawaii is pretty ethnically diverse and a lot of kids are mixed. So I already by nature model them ethnically, but I certainly don't model my, model my kids, just you know me as a human culturally. I'm not from Hawaii. My kids and I talk a lot about local culture and they definitely know that Miss Taurus is not local <laughs> and does not, it does not, it has much to learn about being local. Um, and that's part of it actually. By acknowledging you guys have something special and I wanna learn more about you, it's actually, it's not necessarily modeling, but it's really empowering. Cause I'll ask them all the time, well, when you say this, like what does this phrase mean? Or what does this local idiom mean? Like how, how do I, like how do I use that? Am I using it right? And it makes kids feel like their culture matters. Um, and also I hope it does model that they do the same thing when they encounter other cultures in the future that they don't understand um, or that are new to them or anything like that. So that's one thing. The biggest thing for me though, 
is I'm trying really hard, especially this year, to make sure the, the stories we read, it's a balance of making sure the stories that we read expand their knowledge. So for example, in my ninth grade, we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and my kids have no idea about what the South and out, not no idea, but they have very little understanding of the South and Alabama and the little they do know are very much stereotypes. <laughs> so we're gonna break that down <laughs> um, a little bit. So there's that. And then on the other hand though, I wanna make sure we read stories or we connect that to stories that do model their backgrounds. You know, um, so To Kill a Mockingbird obviously deals with that case and the trial and everything like that. And interestingly, there's a story in Hawaii that is very similar called The Massey Case, where much like the story in To Kill a Mockingbird, these three boys were accused of raping a white woman and it actually was not true at all, but the town got together and once they were acquitted, they killed them. Um, that was in, 19, I think, 1930s, 19, early 1940s Hawaii. Um, and a lot of my kids have heard that story. So I know I actually did this too when Ferguson happened with my ninth graders. We read about that trial in Hawaii and then connected it to what was happening on the mainland so that they could understand these struggles affect all of us. Because I think my students live sometimes in a bubble where they think, well, it's Hawaii, everyone's the same, everyone's equal. And sometimes that's true, but a lot of times it's not. So we need to talk about that. Um, but also though, I was at this great discussion with a group of folks in Houston where I'm blanking on his name, but he was a, he was a minister and he was talking about, of course a culture is gonna hold their heads down when everything you teach them about that culture is that they were enslaved, that they were forced to do manual labor, and then they had to consistently fight for rights that they haven't fully gotten. We don't talk about the struggles of other cultures in the same way we do, certainly about, certainly about blackness and then you know also about Latino struggles. We don't talk about those things. So how am I giving my students not just the struggle, but also the hope in, and the beauty in their cultures too. How are we reading stories that show how beautiful it is to come, to grow up in, I mean, Hawaii, it's pretty obvious on the surface, but you know, with local cultures. So I think there's also making sure that they see stories where their cultures are lifted up and shown as beautiful and valid and worthwhile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me, what makes this so important, because I truly believe that you'll never be, you'll never become, well, you'll never be what you don't know you can become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't and, be what you and when you see certain images or people in your neighborhood, and maybe these same people are represented in your family as well, an education may not have the same importance to you because you figure this is my life. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I am destined to be and then when you turn on the tv and you watch these tv shows and you the people who look like you are comic relief or sidekicks and you know it's a military show and you don't see uh people of color who are officers when we know in the military is a bunch of people of color uh, you know, in a military or any field, you like you just don't see it. And so, as you spoke of earlier, the internalization of I am not good enough. Yeah. Uh, because Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, in uh, in his book, talked about how if you and I'm just paraphrasing, but if you tell a people that they're nothing, that they don't belong, that they're less than that if you tell them long enough, if there is no uh, back door for them, they will create one for their own, for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, how I do this in working in the school system, and uh, I don't know if it makes a difference, but you know, especially when the weather cools down, because right now I can't do that. But normally, long, you know, sh shirt and tie, uh, you know, I, I, I try to present myself as a person mm -hmm. that they go, okay, this is a different type of cat. Uh, and I definitely, when I speak to kids, it's always, you know, come on, you know, uh, what do you expect from yourself? You were born of greatness, mm. like 
take control, that, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not one of those who are like, boy, you ain't going to be nothing. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's always about getting them to understand that if they want something, they have the talents to get it and they have to go out and take it. Yeah. And I think, too, there's that aspect of, because absolutely, and it's so important. And I mean, I know for me, my dad telling me that I had to be that and like them modeling that for me was huge. And I think it's also once they're older, too, showing them how to dismantle why there are folks who are like that. Like they're, so I, the thing I was thinking of while you're talking is I know when, I think, I think it was 50 Cent, when he declared bankruptcy, a lot of people were making jokes about like, oh, you know, he claims to be a baller and like all these things, but you know, this is just what rap culture promotes and all these things. And maybe, but let's also think about like, what have we been showing young, frankly, young black men about how they can gain success when they think, when they're consistently shown in the media, the only way they're gonna be successful is to either play a sport or to, you know, rap or to be a baller. When when that's consistently the message you're getting, I'm not, I, I understand why, some, why a lot of students tell me when I ask, what do you wanna be in a group? They're like a basketball player. Because that's, yeah, that's all they've seen. That's all they've been taught. So I think it's also important to teach kids when they're like, oh, but you know, all of these guys, all of these black people are gangsters and da da da. It's like, one, that's not true. But also, when there are communities of color that are struggling in particular ways, why is that happening? And has that maybe happened because the system has set them up to fail sometimes? Um, like, you know, when someone's like, oh, well, you know, my, my dad's just like everyone else and he went to jail, it's like, okay. And he might have made some choices, but are there also things at large in the system in the community that have not? been as helpful if you'd grown up somewhere else or been from a different background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, folks. I don't know if we got a little deep on that one. <laughs> so are you still with us? Are you still with us? Uh, I see a little viewer down there. So somebody's watching. Uh, so I want to touch on uh, white privilege right now. Yes. So who's like, yes. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Let's do that. Let's so, do that. So where does white privilege fit into the conversation of race and cultural respons culturally responsive teaching? And what motivated you to write about that on your blog? Yeah, so white, I think for me why it was important to talk about, and I do, I do think of it as white privilege sometimes, but I'll also, especially now, so, living in Hawaii. I also just think of it as dominant culture um, because that in a lot of ways is I think what whiteness has become. Um, it's just dominant Western culture. So for me, it was essential to think about it and talk about it because it's the standard that we are all being subconsciously judged on at large in society is, one, is a standard that comes primarily from white privilege. Um, and then also because I want my students to be able to, again, navigate that. And I struggle a lot with that because that's that whole code switching argument, right? Of like, how do you keep your culture and not assimilate, but learn to navigate the system? It's a balance I still don't really have, I think. Um, but I want them to be able to navigate that, but then also essentially dismantle it <laughs> at some point. That's the hope, right? That white privilege is just dismantled. Um, but for me, that's why it was important to talk about it. I think, too, though, there's just this insidious factor of white privilege where if you have, or privilege in general, right? Because let's be honest, I come from a very, I come certainly from quite a bit of socioeconomic privilege. So I've, and you know, I'm also, I'm a straight woman who was born a woman. So I have a ton of privilege myself. And so I think it's understanding that my, even though society validates my reality all the time, it doesn't mean it's the only reality. Not everyone is identifies with the gender they're born with, but society tells me that I'm okay, but someone else isn't, for example. So I think whiteness is just that on a much larger scale because those large systemic things, again, have just purported that dominance over time. So what started as very clear defined Jim Crow era laws are now just hidden in housing practices, in 
who we talked about in education. I brought this up with my students the other day. Why is it that there's an AP Euro history class and an AP US history class, but there, there's, no other, there's, no other, there's no other cultures talked about, but US history and Euro, European history. Same with literature. We teach US literature. We teach European literature. But it's only recently that other states have started implementing Latin studies or Latin literature, African American literature. I know LA just won a pretty historic battle where ethnic studies was finally going to be ha was mandatory in schools. Of course, that encompasses an entire stretch of ethnicities in one class, and then all of Europe also gets its own class. Which okay, but like that's how white privilege plays out in education. Um, I started reading, or I read rather, this book for this program that I'm in called um, "Lies My Teacher Told Me." There's also just so much of our own history we don't talk about um, and that we don't get taught about. And because of it, these cycles of privilege can continue and can continue oppressing not just me, but my kids someday. And I don't just mean my students, but like the children I will have someday will also struggle from that. And I don't want that. So I think for me, the more it's that same thing we came back to. I cannot get rid of it if I can't, or I can't fight against it if I can't, if we don't talk about it. If we don't acknowledge a problem exists, we're not going to get rid of it. So I think that's why it felt important for me to keep pushing people to talk about it because until they recognize that it's an issue, they're not going to understand how maybe they're continuing structures of power in their classroom um, or con continuing structures of dominance in their classroom. I know for me, I went to New Orleans and there was a woman at a school, it was one of the few schools that hadn't been turned into a charter school. And she brought up that just some of the things, some of the ways that we force kids to act just for behavior management might actually be in some ways really oppressive to the cultures they come from. And I, no one had ever, had ever brought that up to me as an educator. And I was so sad that I had done that to my students and that made me feel really bad. Because how often was that done to me? was I told that the way I acted at home was not good enough for the classroom. Um, so I think for me, that's why it was important to talk about it. Okay. Yeah, man, I know. It got <laughs> so deep. It got like. I, was, I said, who? I said, Krista, you going to be okay? <laughs> no. No, I guess. Like, <laughs> yes. As Kendrick okay. says, we're going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I, yeah, I think for me, it's so funny. Now, uh, people in my life, and I mentioned him on the show last time, but you know, my, my boyfriend, for example, he, he, he did not always talk about these issues. Um, he's not in education, you know, he's, he works a different job. Um, and now that he, now that I make him talk about it all the time, he will occasionally be like, babe, I just saw this thing on TV and it's just such a stereotypical representation of Asians and it's just purporting the stereotype of Asians and now I can't stop seeing it. And I'm like, welcome to my world. Every day, boo. <laughs> this, this is my this is my 360. Every day. Once you see it, it's hard to unsee it. So, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's try to leave, let's try to try to leave on a positive note. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, how can we have a more productive conversation about race in education? And what is your advice to folks who? don't want to get involved? Um, so how to have a more productive conversation. I think one of the biggest things, and again, I can put stuff out. Um, first is to educate ourselves consistently. And, and the education never stops. I'm consistently learning and relearning and unlearning all these different things that I was taught. Um, so I know for me, a lot of that came from Educolor, which is this thing on my shirt right here. But if viewers can go to um, Educolor, E-D-U-C-O-L-O-R.org, um, it's a collective that I feel really lucky I get to be a part of. And the folks that run it are amazing. And I consider them mentors. But just a lot of great resources on why do this have, why is it important to have these conversations? And okay. then, and um, why is it important to have these conversations? And then, how can we start having them and what do I need to know and all kinds of things like that. So I think the biggest thing is educating ourselves. Um, there's a great talk from Jay Smooth about how, I think it's how I learned to stop worrying and love talking about race. I'll look up, I have, yeah, it's something I can, but Jay Smooth is a great person to watch. But that one in particular brings up the fact that we all have implicit racial bias. We all do, every single one of us. 
So let's stop being defensive about it and just talk about it. Because once we own that we all have it, it's going to make it a lot easier for us to not get defensive when we have those conversations. So those are two of the big things is like talk about it, educate yourself. Those are the two big things to having a productive conversation, I think. As far as like advice for people that want to get involved, those two things, educate yourself, talk about it. People that don't want to get involved, I got to be honest, well, some of, Dr. Well, some of my advice is just like, well, it's coming at you whether you like it or not. So I hope you jump on the bandwagon, man. Like as clearly, I think as we've moved forward, especially with social media and things like that, we're starting to see that these conversations are happening more and more. They're getting more and more play. People are starting to realize privilege is a thing. Racism is still a thing. Bias is happening. Um, and whether or not people like it, there's going to come a time where it's going to be staring them in the face. And you can keep fighting it, and you can keep saying no, 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 but the the tide's gonna, tide is changing. So I hope people start seeing that instead of running away from it, they can embrace those struggles and have such a much more beautiful and difficult but beautiful nuanced view of the world. It is difficult and it is hard. The work is hard. But there's beauty in that nuance and in that struggle. And so I hope that people that are like, oh, I'm scared to talk about it, dive in. Because you know what? It's better to struggle and then find your footing than it is to consistently be on the sidelines saying, am I doing this right? Or am I screwing this up? I'd much rather we talk about it. So I hope that people decide that it's worth talking about. Because it really is better for them, better for students, better for, better for all of us, really. Awesome, awesome. Uh, hey, I, that's why we gotta have you back. I always enjoy, <laughs> always enjoy, you know, having this conversation. Uh, I did too. Because you're always, uh, you know, really honest about it, and and hopefully people will watch uh, this podcast and will get involved in the conversation. Send you some tweets and. Yeah. And and see, so you, you rep the edge of color. So maybe you'll get some more, some folks joining the movement. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. And that's the best thing is like, I am by no means, I mean, I'm not even the person who founded it. I'm just a, I'm just a person who feels lucky to be able to wear a t-shirt and call myself a part of it. Um, but the great thing is, is like, we, we are all a part of this work. And there's so much to learn. I've given a very small snippet of the things I experienced. But I mean, I'll be honest, five years ago, I would have been one of those people that said, I don't want to talk about this, or why are we still talking about this? Or I said, well, my it did I definitely said things like, well, you know, my family got out of it, so maybe other families can get out of it. And then I understood how unfair that was. So change happens, and I hope people are open to that change. So go out there and learn stuff, folks. Learning stuff is great. That's why you're watching this podcast. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> And not you heard my Muppety face. <laughs> and you heard it, people. Go out there and learn something. Go out there and, all right, all right, all right. Go out there and learn something. Uh, see that? I don't, I don't, people don't need to see that side of me. Um, <laughs> folks, thanks for watching the show. And as always, be you, edu, peace. <laughs>